ever anybody would invent a time machine, which will allow us to go back in time to visit Paris as it used to be, surely 1900 will be the year of choice. In that year Paris, in all its splendor, has the appearance of a calm and nonchalant city. It is filled with architectural splendor, and many Parisians are living a life of fulfillment and prosperity. Nevertheless, the Parisians had started to complain about life becoming more hectic and traffic becoming increasingly more dangerous. The year 1900 marks the beginning of a century that will take the shape of a dazzling fireworks display by the opening of the L'Exposition Universelle. After a turbulent 19th century, Paris prepares itself for a new era, especially with the hope and belief that the triumph of science will bring happiness to mankind. Émile Loubet is the President of the French Republic. He is a man without much presence, but of modest spirit, who is proud of his peasant origins. February 1900. On the big boulevard behind a huge crowd of spectators, a steam omnibus passes. On April the 15th, President Loubet, accompanied by Mr. Laurent, inaugurates the exhibition. For five years, immense works have upset the two banks of the Seine, between Les Invalides and the Eiffel Tower. A new mysterious city inside another city has been created. The whole district of Paris has undergone a metamorphosis of mega proportions. Near the Pont Alexandre III, Two monumental constructions have emerged that eventually become the splendor of the exhibition, the Grand and the Small Palace. The Grand Palace is devoted to fine arts, contemporary paintings and sculptures. It is the tour de force of architect Henri de Glan. Because of the water infiltration caused by the nearby River Seine, the palace rests on 40,000 piles of massive oak. 
The small palace contains a retrospective exhibition of French art, bringing together the riches of provincial museums and the treasures of the churches. The first metro line between Port Maillot to Port Vincennes was inaugurated on the 19th of July 1900. One of the most remarkable engineering wonders of the exhibition is the Trottoir Roulant. It consists of two moving sidewalks that run in parallel. One runs at a speed of 4.5 km and the other at no less than 8.5 km per hour. Pedestrians can easily get on the platform and change from the slow to the faster speed platforms without any danger. It's just a matter of holding on to the platform poles that move along with the platform. On the left, an inexperienced young woman tries to move from one platform to another without losing her dignity. The movement is continuous. A single rate applies of 50 cents per ride. The moving sidewalk passes in the background, while in the foreground the sidewalk rolls in the opposite direction. In the distance, the travellers on the moving platform can be seen moving away towards the avenue of La Motte Piquet. On the Esplanade des Invalides, in front of the Alexander III bridge, a city of white palaces made of wood and plaster has risen out of the ground. Countries from around the world compare the products, like furniture, carpets, jewellery, fabrics, rubber, as well as show their recent applications of great novelty. The moving sidewalk then runs along the Quai d'Orsay towards the Pont Alma. After which the visitors can view a splendid panorama of the pavilions built along the River Seine. Rolling footbridges connect the platforms with the palaces, while the visitors follow this route. This strange looking building of Sweden is constructed with layers of wood. Next to the Swedish pavilion, a large Florentine style square building forms the palace of the Principality of Monaco. The pavilion of Spain borrows its towers from the Alcazar of Toledo. Next to it is the rustic pavilion of Norway, constructed from pine wood. Belgium's pavilion represents a reproduction of the town hall of Oudenaarde. England's pavilion is a copy of a 16th century castle called Kingston House. On the corner, the tall strangely shaped building is the pavilion of Hungary, with next to it that of Bosnia-Herzegovina and of Austria, which is in Baroque style. The pavilion of the United States is distinguishable by its large dome. On the opposite riverbank, on the current site of the Museum of Modern Art, stands a reconstruction of Old Paris, as envisioned by Mr. Albert Robidas, who was famous for his futuristic novels. Not very far from there, a large Swiss village has been erected between the Avenue de Suffran and La Motte Piquet. There were valleys, waterfalls, green pastures and pine woods where lots of entertainment was going on in this enchanting artificial mountain landscape made from plaster and cement.
The celestial globe was 60 meters high. Inside, concerts were given, conducted among other by Saint-Saëns. Near the Avenue de la Bourdonnais, the moving platform passes in front of the buildings at the height of the windows of the first floor. Many palaces dedicated to large industry and agricultural production stretched across the Champ de Mars from the École Militaire to the Eiffel Tower. From the first floor of the Eiffel Tower, the view extended from the other side of the Seine to the Chaillot Hill, where the pavilions of the colonies were located. Nowadays this area is known as Trocadero. The wonderful palace of electricity was adorned with a diadem made from zinc and glass, which at night would emanate multicolored sparks representing the fairy of electricity. Here, President Loubet is seen leaving the Palais des Fêtes. It was a large circular room with a huge dome of 90 meters in diameter. It is from there that numerous folkloric parades depart and where also the operators of the Lumiere brothers will tirelessly film the festival. This is the Feast of Wine. The next procession is dedicated to woman, who is queen of all these parties, queen of flowers, queen of perfumes, queen of all the dreams that tourists have about the style of Parisian life. The last procession involves chariots pulled by Senegalese tribesmen representing colonial glory. The chariot is escorted by women, who for mysterious reasons are adorned with white wings. The Eiffel Tower is surrounded by gardens, spectacular flower beds and fountains. In the background on the right is the imposing pavilion of machines. At the foot of the Trocadero Hill, the pavilions of French and foreign colonies are grouped together. The whole hill breathes the air of an exotic dream, whereby the casbahs mingle with the mosques, pagodas and the straw huts. Traditional local dances are performed, mint tea is served and children mingle in. To close the exhibition, President Loubet has invited all the mayors of France for a happening in the gardens of the Tuileries. The exhibition was not only a success, but also a blessing for the French people, who had thus far travelled little across the world, and this way got the opportunity to somewhat shake off the hatred towards foreigners. The exhibition had relaxed the nerves and stimulated a truce between men. The images of this event have a much further reach than simply a faint memory stored in family albums. These gentlemen with moustaches and hats were at the forefront of development that seems natural to us today. The year 1900 saw the beginning of a new era that would produce great things to the benefit of mankind, like the internal combustion engine, the first airship, the invention of liquid air, the cinema, the first giant transatlantic ocean liners, and especially the domestication of electricity. The fairy of electricity on top of the palace of electricity truly sparkled with brilliance. Hopefully you enjoyed the journey in our time machine, to a time when Paris was at its peak, in a period during which the technological marvels of today's society were in its infancy.